So like I said, I'd like to give a little exhortation before he gets started preaching. He was telling me this morning that he's been, uh, well, actually told me a couple days ago, he's been reading Romans a lot and studying Romans. And he said, I just can't get away from Romans. And he said, I guess I'm going to teach it today. And he was talking about how, you know, it's kind of hard. Romans is kind of a hard book to understand to some degree. And Paul just jumps all around and, and we tend here to like messages that speak to us on our day-to-day life, you know, what we're dealing with on our jobs, with our marriage, with our finances, with our kids, you know, things that talks to us absolutely personally. And then a lot of times then we're encouraged or we're corrected or whatever. And he was telling me today, he said he doesn't feel like it's that kind of a message. So I wanted to exhort that, you know, the things that God gives Mike are so important. And we have a tendency to see decades in the future. And sometimes that's a little hard for people to grab because, you know, as Americans, we tend to live for today and this week. But I'm I'm just exhorting you to pull on the Spirit of God because not only for us, but the people on the Internet need to hear some of the truths that God is bringing forth in this place. And it's like I was sharing a year or two ago about the Apostle Paul and how he talked about, he said, I'm a man born out of season. Well, we know he wasn't because God knows what he's doing. And it says in the Word that, God places us in our time, our season, the geography where we are. He places it. So Paul really wasn't born out of season, but he prophesied so many years ahead of the people he was living around, okay? And like I said a couple years ago, the things that Paul taught, he's preaching them to us, Gentiles, 2,000 years later. It's for us. And as Mike's been digging in and studying and reading and reading and praying and asking, God is beginning to unveil things to him. And sometimes he and I, sometimes we feel we're born out of season because a lot of things that we are pushing and feeling and wanting so bad, the rest of the church doesn't even have a clue. They don't care. They don't even know what you're talking about a lot of times because they are so focused on what we like to call the 80s where it's, bless me, God, I'll take the word and I'll use it and I'll get better, better health, better blessings, better money, better marriage. That's a part of it, yes. But we have so strong, we want to push this kingdom forward. We want to end this present evil age. And we may think, well, I like living now. Well, of course we do. Because God's put us in this time and age. But if we want to end this present in evil system and stop the works of the devil, his destruction, his murder, his pain, his sorrow, his grief, his, you know, the famine, the destruction and stuff he was teaching about a week or two ago, we've got to have more than what we've got in the American church right now. As you look around and if you visit churches, it's basically what we heard in the 80s. There's not much difference And when you look at the church, there's not much change. When we look in the mirror of God's word, does anybody look like the Apostle Paul? Does anybody look like John, the Apostle? Does anybody look like James or even Peter? We don't look anything like that, do we? So that tells me the pattern is wrong of what we have been walking in, believing for, for 20-some years. There's aspects of truth in it, of course, but the pattern in itself. And if we want, you know, we know God has called us all as forerunners to change things, to, to shift and tilt and change the religious system. If we're going to do it, guess what? We've got to have our lives changed. And so as he begins to preach, let's allow the Spirit of God to work. It's, it's things that that he says it might be hard to understand or explain right now, and, but I'm sure God will have him teach it again and again till we really grasp it and begin to work it out. Because in order to bring revolution and a reformation to, to America especially, the way we've done it for the last 20, 30 years, it isn't cutting it, is it? And I want to become like the Apostle John. I want to become like the Apostle Paul and Peter and all of them, Mark even, all of them. 
I want to be that, and I want our people to be this. I want us to grow and mature where we aren't just focused on this life right here, me, myself, and I, but we see into the heavenlies and we pull it down and we're able to impart it to other people that don't have a clue. And that's what I want you to pull on the spirit today of what God is saying. So, Father, we thank you that we open our hearts wide to you. God, I'm asking for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in this place. I'm asking for the spirit of prophecy that is the testimony of Jesus Christ, that is your spirit, Father, of prophecy floods this place and floods the Internet. God, we have eyes to see, ears to hear, that our hearts are open, tender, just eager, wanting to grasp the word that you're bringing to us this day, that, God, it works deep in our guts, God, that even if it goes beyond our understanding, it lodges down inside the incorruptible seed that continues to grow and produce great fruit in our life. God, that's what we're longing for. Your kingdom come right here, right now, right on earth, exactly as it is in heaven. And, God, we know that you said in your word, show the house to the house. And that's what we want, God. We want to see where we are and where we're to go. And Father, I thank you that you move upon us with great wisdom, great grace, great anointing to pull us up to areas where we are lacking. Father, pull us up into areas where we have understanding, God, so that we can flow with you and not resist the Holy One of Israel. I thank you, Father God, that the word to us is sweet in our ears, sweet in our mouth, But even if it comes down and divides us asunder and it turns bitter in our belly, God, that to every hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. That we don't want to be a self-satisfied soul that loathes your word and loathes your honeycomb. We want to be hungry. We want to be thirsty. And we want to be teachable people by your spirit. For your spirit is the one that teaches us all things. That we don't have to have man to teach us. We have your spirit teaching through man, of course or through woman. And I thank you, Father God, for your power and your grace and your anointing and the glory of God in this place. The glory of God, your goodness, that changes us into the likeness of Jesus Christ because that is our heart's desire. We would not be here this long plowing as a group, working together, trying to come into total unity with you and with each other. Father, we would not be here this many decades if we were not wanting to become like Jesus Christ. We thank you for these step-by-step things you're doing in our life. And we appreciate you and we appreciate our pastor Mike laying his life down, trying to seek you daily, Father, for a living word. Father, I thank you that he's not a man that that just turns to Reader's Digest or old things or digs out old sermons and says, well, I think I'll teach this again. They won't remember. Father, I thank you that he's diligently to say, what do we have need of? How do we walk this out? How do we push your kingdom forward? How do we become like Jesus Christ? And Father, I just praise you for your anointing upon his lips. They are anointed with your grace. The lips, Father God, that speak a word in due season to us who's weary, that corrects us, that teaches us, trains us, disciples us, opens up the eyes of our understanding and and enlarges our vision, God. Enlarge our vision this day, Father. Cause us, cause us, God, to walk with you more hungry by the time the service is over, more hungry for you than we've ever been before. And we thank you and we praise you for it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, hon. Just want to, again, thank Kathy for that. She's my confidant. She's my somebody I really love because she loves the way I preach and she always likes my messages and and uh, always encourages me. And, you know, something that she prayed here just a little bit ago was enlarge our vision. Well, I'm going to enlarge it just a little bit. Just, you know, she, and, and I understand what she said. We wanna, she said, I want to be like Paul. I want to be like John. But let's enlarge that. Because they didn't bring in what was supposed to be brought in. But that's a good goal to go for. And the reason we, we, listen, the reason we look at people is because they were people. That looks like an obtainable goal to us when we think about Paul. Maybe, maybe not most people, but 
when we look at Paul, at least we know a human being was like that. But my vision is there's not just going to be one human being here and one human being there and one human being there. Is there's going to be a church that's going to go beyond all of these writers. And I carry that vision all the time, and it's a very frustrating vision because, as Kathy said, we listen to so many different things, and people are still so stuck in what was being taught. You know, it's getting pretty near 40 years ago. That's a long time. Uh, Again, I was listening to somebody last week, and again, it was the authority message, and you take an authority over your circumstances to change your circumstances, and I'm thinking, you know, and I know it's because they haven't seen it, but what I, what I told Kathy is, I says, I think what people, I don't think enough people read their Bibles. I think they read other books about what other people wrote about the Bible, and that's where they spend most of their reading time. And I don't think people go to the Word of God and say, all right, I'm opening this up. Show me where I'm wrong. Show me how I can increase in your government in my life. And I'm willing to lay down anything I believe, anything that I think is correct or incorrect, and allow it to be changed. I don't think people read that way. I don't think most people read that way. Um... Something that Kathy has shared about one of her family members is they're terrified of being wrong. As well, you're in a bad spot then to be in the kingdom of God. Because you have to want to be wrong. You know what I mean by that? You can't change unless you want to be in error. In other words, when you go to the scripture, you're actually looking for where am I in error? Where am I wrong? And if you're terrified of that, it's going to be very difficult for God to speak to you in the Word of God to change you. And how many people are? How many of us are afraid of that, of being wrong? <laughs> A lot of us are, some even more than others. <clears throat> so as Kathy said, I'm going to start, and I don't know how I'm going to do this, I'm going to start in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start reading and I would like to go through the entire book of Romans. Not today. <laughs> Over the course of maybe the summer. But I don't know how long. I want to at least try to get partway through chapter 3 today. And this is basically going to be a message. And you've got to understand something. Though, though some of us may understand this, um, it, it's not going to be anything... There'll be some new things, maybe, some definitions of some words, but I basically want to talk about law, because this is what this is about. It's about law and grace and faith. You know, and I mentioned last week, if you recall last week I was here, and I was talking about the laws are tutor to bring us to Christ. Remember when I taught on that? Was that last Sunday? I think it was last Sunday, wasn't it? Was it Wednesday? It was Sunday. It was one, anyway, it was a while back. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I did the fear thing the Wednesday before that, and I kind of tied it in. So I want to be talking about law and grace and faith. Uh, Romans is considered by scholars the greatest book that Paul wrote. It's his greatest work. And you really have to understand Romans to understand the rest of his letters. And actually, the, the, all the letters, both from Peter and John and, and, and Jude and James, you really need to understand the book of Romans. And, and I always say, I'm not a person who thinks that things are placed in the Bible haphazardly. I think the book of Romans was placed after the book of Acts because that's the first book of what we would call, you know, the epistles. And so it's there for the first, it's there because we read that one first, and if you read it over and over and over and over again, you start to get an understanding because you're reading it with the attitude, just like I said, you're going to it and saying, God, I want to understand what this guy is saying. Because he sounds like he's double-talking all the time. Do you know what I mean? He sounds like he's, he's, ta he's saying things and it almost can tie your tongue up trying to read it. You have to read it real slow. And I was telling Kathy this morning, I said, you know, that I would, if I was writing it, there's things I would put in different places because he'll, he'll start with a thought and then he'll go to another thought and then go 
to another thought, and five chapters later, he goes back to this thought that he was back here. And you have forgotten this that was back here, and if you just put all your thoughts together, you could understand it a lot easier. So it is a great book. It's, it's, uh, like I said, it's considered Paul's greatest work. It's where Martin Luther got the Reformation. It was out of the book of Romans. And Martin Luther made a fatal, fatal mistake in his interpretation of this book. And it's still with us today. And even though you and I, listen, even though you and I are charismatics, word of faith, believing in the goodness of God and the wonderful of God, and we know what faith is, we know what grace is, that, still, that, that law, grace, faith thing still resides in us because it's been, it was driven into us so deeply. Those of us especially that were churched, if you were never churched, you're probably in a better position than those of us that, w- that were churched, if you were never churched. Because this was pounded into us and pounded into us and pounded into us. This fatal mistake was pounded into us, and it still crops up now and then in church. I've dealt with it for 30 years. I'm not saying it's cropped up in the, in the last week or two. I'm saying it, it crops up every now and then. When I talk to church people, sometimes I hear it come out of our mouths, and I've heard it since, I, since Kathy and I took over. And so I want to try to share with you what that mistake was, and hopefully in the next weeks, I'll try to bring some grace and faith with it today, but I'm I'm basically going to be talking about law today. So you're going to have to bear with me. Those that are on the internet, you're going to have to, you know, I don't know how God's going to do it. You know, He may throw in the grace and faith at the end so that nobody's confused or anything, but I would encourage anybody, of course, this isn't live, but to, to listen to them time after time till we get through this book. Okay? So let's open with Romans chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> Something I probably should mention too is, is that when we talk about law... When Paul was writing this, remember, these letters hadn't been written. That's why he's using the Old Testament in it as an example. What would God's law be? Ten Commandments? What, what else? Anything else? Huh? What else? Is anything that God commands us to do, would you call that a law? So if he commands us to not be angry, isn't that God's law? If he commands us to... How many times does it say, since we've got kids here, how many times does it say, children, obey your parents? Huh? Does it say that a lot of times? Is that God's law? That's not in the Ten Commandments, though. I mean, it could be, because it says, it says, honor your father and your mother, but... There's a lot of commandments that are broke down that you could go back and find in a general sense in the Ten Commandments, but anything that God commands us is one of God's laws, right? So when Paul uses examples, he's going to be using Old Testament example, all right, because he didn't have any of the New Testament. If Paul was writing today, he could pick something out of these epistles and he could use that as an example. Okay, Paul, this is... Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God. Now what's he telling us right there? He's telling us that he's both man and God, right? was appointed the Son of God in power by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Him we received grace, that's divine influence on the heart, and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from the faith for His namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be His holy people. 
How many are called to be His holy people? Everybody, aren't they? I think it's interesting. You know, we get words here from time to time. I'm going to address this. And, and we like to, and, I, and I'm certainly not saying this is wrong. I'm just saying, you know, sometimes our children will show a little bit of gumption to, you know, praise and worship, or praise and, worship some, and then we'll go give them a word. Well, you've called, been called the lead. Everybody's been called the lead. That's not, you're not special. You've been called the lead. Everybody's going to lead somebody somewhere. Justine has been called the lead. Kathy's been called the lead. Brenda's been called the lead. Danielle's been called the lead. Every child here has been called the lead. But we like to grab onto somebody when we see a little bit of gumption in them. But they can turn around and lead somebody the wrong way. You know, everybody's, just about everybody is following somebody. Did you know that? Good or bad? It's very, very, very difficult to find an individual. They're always following somebody. They want to be part of a group. It's hard to find somebody that's an individual. It would have been very... I, let's see, I would have been very attracted to Jesus for that reason. Because he was never part of a group. I mean, he was as far as the spirit realm was concerned. But you'll notice he never paid any attention to whether people followed him or not. I'd like to know what kind of an attitude that is to have. To where you're never afraid of mankind. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because your faith is being reported all over the world. Now, when I read this, I'm not going to stop a lot in here. I will occasionally. Because I've got to get to where he starts getting into the meat of everything, okay? Because this is just kind of a greeting. It says, because your faith is reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how consistently, how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Now, isn't that the way it's supposed to work? In other words, when we get a special speaker in here, it's supposed to be a mutual thing. We're supposed to be encouraged, but they're supposed to be encouraged also. It's a mutual encouragement. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but have prevented from doing so until now. Uh, the, New, the New King James says have been hindered. Now, here's my question. Notice what he said. He said, I plan many times to come to you, but he said he's been hindered. Why didn't he just take his authority? Because that's what I hear all the time. That's what I heard when I heard the authority teaching. Is why didn't Paul, if Paul could take authority, if somebody could take authority, wouldn't you think Paul would be able to? I think there's another uh, a scripture, I don't know where it is, where he's going to Macedonia or something, and he said Satan was hindering them. Why didn't he just take authority over it? And I'm going to share this again, I'm going to hit this again and again, because authority was given to us to change the way we react and act towards the hindrances. That's where you've been given authority. That's the mountain that's immovable, is our attitudes, our actions. Let me show you how to balance this is. I want to... There's, well, I, I, I got to say this first. You all know this. I'm not against healing. I'm not against the physical healing of the body, right? You know that, right? You should know that, correct? All right, there's a church down south here. They've got a house of hope and healing. 
I'm, you're all familiar with it, right? How many people do you think go in there to get healed of a character sickness? You know what I mean by a character sickness? What's a character sickness? Offense, anger, fear, jealousy, competition, huh? guilt, complacency, apathy. And I shared this several weeks ago, if we get a terminal disease, physical disease, all life stops while we try to find an answer from God. Everything that was important before the doctor said you're going to die, where does that go when he tells you that? It goes right out the window, doesn't it? But when we have a spiritual sickness, we just add it to the list of important things. You know what I mean by that? It's important, but all those other things that were important to us stay just as important. But if it's a physical disease, everything that I had planned, all my dreams, all my money, all my hopes, all the things I wanted to accomplish, go out the window. Now I'm focused on one thing. But if we have a spiritual sickness, that's what I'm saying. It's just as terminal as a physical sickness. Yeah. That's, and it sometimes brings about the sickness. Now you know why I am so adamant on the character issues and not so much on the healing issues. But if you look at most church, it's the healing issue that gets all the attention. It's like, it's like the character issues are important but we just add them to the list of all the important things that we'd have in our lives. But the physical aspect of it now becomes the entire focus of our life. See how out of balance it is? That's why I preach the way I preach, and that's why I'm reading what I'm reading in Romans. I'm certainly not against people going to the house open healing to get healed. I'm just wondering what the percentage is of people who go there to get healed to get prayed for for spiritual things versus physical things. What do you think the percentage is? I'm going to ask somebody one of these days. I'm going to, I'm going to ask somebody and see if they ever come in and say, you know, I'm offended. This certain thing happens to me all the time at work or in, in church or something. I get offended all the time and I need healing for this. I'm competitive all the time. I compete all the time. I need healed of this because competition isn't from the kingdom of God. I don't think a lot of that prayer is going forth. I am obligated both to Greeks Well, wait a minute. I think I skipped one, didn't I? I planned many times and have been prevented so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I'm obligated to both Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And I, I know Kathy has brought up that it's, it's not being ashamed of the gospel. That's the power, is you're not ashamed of it. If you're ashamed of it, there's no power. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from the first to the last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. 
since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Now when we start reading these next scriptures, I have to tell you, and I have to go into this, don't think other people. Okay? Think of us church people. What is the wrath of God? Okay, it's the devil. Do you know what the word wrath means? It means, in any, just about in all the verses, because I looked it all up. Just about all the verses. It means desire with anger. I know you think it means just anger, right? But it means desire with anger. And notice what it says. For the wrath of God is being revealed. Where is it being revealed from? It says from heaven. See, we read this. Now, like I say, it's going to be really hard for me. I told Kathy, I said, you know, I lay in bed and you're in that half asleep mode. And this is so clear. And when you wake up, it becomes, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's so, I mean, you're sitting there in that half asleep mode, and it's almost like you can, you can see it with, your, with some kind of eyes, physical eyes or something, how real this is and how clear it is. And, and, you, and words are going off in your head, and it's so clear the way you're saying it. And as soon as I wake up, I start to say it, and it immediately starts to get gibberish. That's why we have to catch what's being said here. And so, God, God is, so Paul is writing, and he says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth. Well, if they're suppressing the truth, that must mean they know it, right? So you'd have to be trying to suppress it. What did you say? Yeah, who suppress the truth in, uh, in their, by the witness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. In other words, God is very plain, but we've got a lot of people trying to suppress the truth. And I'll go more into this wrath here in a little bit, okay? Because I have to describe what it means to have desire with anger, okay? Do, let me ask you a question. Do you think God has wrath? I mean, God the Father. Yeah, exactly. How? Explain that to me. He has desire to see his people come to the truth of who he is, and it makes him angry that the enemy can come in there and blind them. There you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. See, God has wrath because it's his desire for us. But he's angry because of the, of the sin that's destroying our lives. But now we also know the devil has great wrath. So does he have desire with anger? And what is his desire? <clears throat> have you to do it his way. It's his desire to have you fulfill salvation without God. And do you think he's angry about it? And how is his anger manifested? Destruction. Destruction. So when you read about the wrath of God, don't look at it as God wanting to pound you in the head. Yeah, God the Father. Don't read it as though it's going to be God's up there waiting to get angry at you. The wrath of God is against me. You want the wrath of the Father, just like you want the Father to kill you. 
I know that's hard for people to understand because we've been so religionized. We want God to kill our self-life so that a new life resurrects. I'll do go more into this, this wrath here in a little, maybe, hopefully today. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him or recognized Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory or the recognition of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for degrading their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served what? Created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. In other words, what were they worshipping? Okay, they, idols. What would that be? Let's make it for today. If we were going to be worshipping created things today... What would, we, what would we worship? Money, job, sports, family, cars, fame, uh, hunting, fishing, uh, huh? our own wisdom, man's technology, man's education. So they worship the created things. Now, think. I want you to think, think, think. How many of us as church people still fall back into this? How many of, and how many of church people have never even started to get out of it yet? I mean, when I look at, when we start reading all of these terrible things, it describes the church. Because if you look at statistics, I got it right. I didn't have to say facts this time. But don't ask me to say it again. If you look at those... It shows that there's no difference between the church and the world. Now, admittedly, that's taking the whole church, right? In other words, every religious group that calls itself a church. <clears throat> because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with a woman and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, as they did not think it worthy to retain the knowledge of God, the word retain there means continued possession. What does continued possession mean? What would that mean to you? Continued possession. Not ever letting go. If you had a continued possession of something, it would be with you all the time, wouldn't it? In other words, how many of you have got uh, a uh, favorite bracelet or a cor some people, huh? Wedding ring. A wedding ring would be a good one. I, I used to know people that carry a certain coin in their pocket. And it was, it was all worn, all it was was a silver slug. All the face and the date and everything had been worn off because they kept it in their pocket. They carried it everywhere they went. I don't know, they may even took a shower with it, I don't know. But it was in their pocket. And some people carry things. In other words, if you have something in a constant possession, that's what it means to retain the knowledge of God. Because when you have a constant possession of God, what happens? Is it just a, is it just a constant possession of the letter? If you have the constant possession of the knowledge of God, do you think He's going to increase it? How can you have a constant possession of God and not be increased? It's only when you limit God to Sunday and Wednesday night that it becomes stagnant. Because obviously something else has taken the place and you're carrying something else constantly with you. How many, how many of us sometimes retain the knowledge of something else and carry that with us? Your whole focused thought is that thing. You can't go to sleep because of it. And when you finally do, you wake up and it's right there. Anybody ever done that? You've had an argument with somebody. And you retain the knowledge of them, 
all day and all night and all the next morning. And you're still talking to them as though they're right there because you retained them. See, that's the way it was supposed to be with God. And they, they, notice what it says. It says they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. So you and I should be, have the retention of God everywhere that we go. And I think I've shared this before, and I think some of you have too, that no matter where we go, no matter where I go, He's always with me. And like I said, sometimes it makes it very difficult to enjoy certain worldly things, like a ball game or something. You know why? Because you're retained. God is retained in your mind. And while you're watching a game and everybody's jumping and yelling and everything, what are you thinking of? These people have no clue. Look at how they cheer over this, but won't cheer over... I mean, those things... And so it takes some of the enjoyment away. How many times have I been hunting and I've retained the knowledge of God and I'm up there preaching to myself out loud in a stand? It doesn't work out real well. It does, but not for hunting. Works out good for me because I get a lot of revelation there. But God should be somebody that we carry and retain with us all the time. Don't ever think it not worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. So God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Do we have a depraved mind sometimes? When we retain somebody that we've argued with? Would you say that's depraved? Because what life comes out of it? And you, do, you do, and you do know that when you're arguing with those people, they can't hear you. <laughs> you're only arguing with yourself. <laughs> yeah, but the next time they argue with me, I'll be ready for them. They never say the same thing. You never get involved with the same argument. So you've made all of those nice memory things for nothing. You've memorized all those lines and all of those things to get at for nothing. So that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Uh Uh-oh, they disobey their parents. We don't have any of those in here, do we? They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? And what do you think all that means there in chapter 2, from verse 1 to where we just read? Hmm? Kathy? Anybody? Cassie? Well, most people think that means don't judge at all, but he's mm-hmm. talking to, I mean, it starts in chapter 2. Some people start in chapter 2, but chapter 1 is talking to a certain kind of people. Right. And so if you're that person... You shouldn't be judging one another because you're not doing it in the spirit of God. You're doing it out of your own intellect and your own will. And, and he says, don't do that. You know. I think it's interesting because as I've watched in 30 years of ministering here, I'm always amazed. And, and again, I don't, you know, it's hard for me to preach to such a small group of people. 
and not everybody think, well, you're talking to me. So, no, I'm not really talking to you. I'm talking in the last 30 years is, is the amount of mercy people show their own children versus what they show anybody else's. That's probably the best way I can describe this because I've watched people judge other people's children and say, well, they should not let them do this, and they, should, and they should be doing this, they should be doing that. And then they'll turn right around with their own children and let them do all of it. So they're practicing the same thing that the other parent is doing. It's just that we're able to see the other parent and we judge it. See, God expects an equal weight, an equal balance. Do you know what I mean? I saw it a lot in the store, and some of you probably have too, is, is, you know, since I worked in a food store, probably what's one of the biggest complaints that we would have for customers working in a, that, that we would complain about customers about working in a food store? Huh? Well, that, no, I don't have anything, no, not, it, that's not it. No. It's people that are on government help. I mean, people complain about that and complain about, well, they should not be. Look at that, they're driving a new car, and I don't know why they're on this. And, I'm, and every, I mean, a lot of people that went out, you know, as soon as they get out the door, there they are judging them. And guess what happened when their kids got on it? Yeah. Then it was fine. See, you're judging others while you practice the same thing. Those are just two examples. Yeah. Don't you think, too, like, um, God's the judge. We're not the judge, but we're to have righteous judgment. Right. Mm-hmm. Because when we judge, it's like, it's way back to Adam and Eve. We're, we want to judge what's right and wrong, you know? And it's God's the one. He's the judge. Mm-hmm. And we're to have righteous judgment, but it's not our own. It's his judgment. Mm-hmm. I know Kathy's brought this up many times before. The end of verse or the end of chapter one, it says, "Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but they also approve of those who practice them." It's amazing how many times we go and we pay for movies, where we approve of what people are doing in the movies. Do you know what I mean? That are incorrect things, but we're approving of them. We're practicing it, and we're also approving of them doing the same thing. Huh? You know, one of the things, another thing that when, when, when I saw in the store was, you know, I got to watch several generations of kids come up. And when their children were little, they used to pick on people who would sleep around. Or people in the store. No offense mainly women because they're always gossipy always you know and they would complain about how oh, they're sleeping with so and so or they're doing this or you know who knows who they're sleeping with now and this and that and then what happened when their kids did it full support then it was okay then you better not say anything about kids sleeping around when their kids got on food stamps, you better not say anything about government help. You could before their kids got on it. That's what he's talking about here. And so how many times in people in church do we point the finger at people that are doing certain things and we, if we get in the same situation, practice the same thing? Okay, we'll continue. <clears throat> But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good 
seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good first for the Jew and for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Now, you see, we read something like this, and if you were to read this at face value, what would you get out of that that I just read? That God's going to give both the good and the bad. Okay, let me, let me read it again. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. See, we read something like that, and this is what I would get out of it, is that if I do evil, bad things are always going to be happen to me. But if I do God stuff, things are always going to be hunky-dory for me. Isn't that what you read in that? Peace, honor, glory, recognition. Sounds like everything's going to go my way. Is it happening that way? No. So then what does this really mean then? What it, no, well listen, what it means is, is that when God changes your nature and character, and you start acting and reacting differently towards the situations that come in life, you'll have peace. How many of us get upset every, on a weekly, maybe monthly basis on things that are happening in our lives? That next month will be nothing. Then how come we can't have peace now? While we're going through the thing. Recognition, glory, honor, peace. That's what the change in nature and character is supposed to bring. Jesus said, in the world you're going to have tribulations. In other words, the same thing that's happening to the unbelievers, the evil people, is going to be happening to us. You know, when I became a Christian, did you know my tires still wear out? I don't understand that, because God said I was going to have peace. Why are my tires wearing out? Why did my basement water start leaking? Why does our washer break down? Why does stuff bad stuff happen to me? Because God said that if I'm doing good, all, I'm going to have peace. How can I have peace if my tires are wearing out? How can I have peace when I go to Colorado and it's raining cats and dogs and I've got to go down a mud road with a trailer? <laughs> and I'm going down a <laughs> steep hill. A, a four-wheeler's coming up at me. And if you slide off the tracks, it's... Goodbye, camper pickup, and maybe you. How am I how am I why did that happen? Exactly. It happens to everybody. So what is Paul writing here? He's saying that those who continually do good and fight for the kingdom of God are eventually going to get to a place where they have glory, peace, and honor. That's what Kathy, when she said, I want to be like Paul and John and James, it looks to me like no matter what they were going through, they had peace and glory and honor. How did they get that? Huh? Because they, yeah, they constantly retained the knowledge of God and their eyes were constantly focused beyond their own selves and got out there to the kingdom of God.
See, if you read it on face value, that's what it seems like. Well, if I do evil, I'm going to have a lot of troubles in life, but if I do good, things are going to just go like on I'm on the interstate. Boy, they're just going to be smooth. But you know, if I read about these guys' lives, it doesn't look like it appeared that way. It didn't look like when they got into the kingdom of God that their life turned into like a highway. In fact, it actually looks like it got worse. I think, huh? I think Paul was on a pretty good highway, wasn't he? He's a Pharisee, so he had money, prestige, honor, and all of a sudden he goes to off scouring of the world. The more he's loved, the less he's loved. He's being chased, beaten. Everybody, a lot of people leave him. Stonings, shipwrecks. So it, you can see, look, uh, the only reason I'm really belaying this, or yeah, belaboring this, is because I want to show you how people can get so deceived into thinking what value is it to serve God, because my life is not, you know, I, I got into this a year, two years ago, ten years ago, and my life hasn't turned into a highway yet. Your life isn't supposed to turn into a highway. Your attitude is supposed to turn into the highway. That you're, are, are the way we act and react to things is supposed to be the highway. Not the situations in life. I'll be so glad when the church gets this. So every time you read in the Old Testament that God's going to, or New Testament, that God's going to do this, and, and it's going to be wonderful and glorious and everything, don't keep looking for your circumstances to get better. Say, I want my attitude to match what it is that you're saying, and then I'll be at peace. Do you think Paul was uh, uh, at peace when he was abased? What does abased mean? Without. You think he was at peace with that? Said he was content in no matter what state he was in. Wouldn't it be nice to walk into the house of hope and healing and say, you know, I want to pray that I'll be content in no matter what state I'm in. I need that. As do, I, everything else, I've thrown, I, I had hopes that I was going to do this next week, this next month. I was going to go on vacation this year. I was going to do this. None of that means anything. I have got to have contentment in no matter what position I'm in. Paul had it, and I want it. So would you please pray for me? I'm going to be here every day, and we're going to pray for this until I get it. How many do that for healing? <clears throat> all who sin apart from the law will perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. To keep, keep this verse in your head as I go on, okay? Paul is not making a sarcastic statement. Paul is making a true statement. It's those who obey the law will be declared righteous. Because I'll show you where the mistake is here if I can get over here. <clears throat> Indeed, when the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, <clears throat> they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God, ju God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know His will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, 
Because you have in the law the embodiment of the knowledge of truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed or spoken evil of among the Gentiles because of you. How much of that has happened across America? How much have we preached these things and yet we go out and do the same things? I'm, the reason I keep hitting all of this and I stop and talk and I say these things, I know we all know these things, but I want you to catch a flavor of what's going on across the world right now in the church realm. Because not a lot has changed. Even in the charismatic word of faith movement, this is still very much operational in a lot of churches and a lot of church leadership. See, we preach these things and then the name of God is blasphemed. You know, a lot of times we want to pick on the news stories because they pick on us so much or they reveal certain things that have happened in church. Hey, we're bringing it on ourselves. Don't pick on them. They're just doing what's natural. Of course, they're going to show where some preacher has done something wrong or something. But how, how about if we start living what we preach? Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person who is not a Jew... A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Now, when we, now I've taught on circumcision here. Do most of you remember what it is that I taught? It it's, was the, the sign was you cut away the flesh. Why? So that the life force of man, when it passed through into the woman, was not touched by flesh. So when Jesus speaks, when God's voice speaks, aren't you glad that God is circumcised? Because when He speaks, His life forth force, <laughs> forth, His life force comes forth, and it doesn't touch flesh. Hopefully your heart is circumcised so that when it goes into you, it doesn't touch flesh. And that when you speak, it doesn't come out and touch flesh. Because what happens when God's Word touches flesh? Brings forth death. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? He says, much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. In other words, they got all the covenants. They had the God speaking to them. The reason you and I have this is because it came to the Jews first. That's why you and I got this. <clears throat> what if some were unfaithful? Were they, were, will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? No. No matter what you do, no matter how many people walk away from God, aren't you glad God's the way He was? Because how many times do you want to stop your faithfulness when people walk away from you? When people are unfaithful to you, how many times do you want to give up on your faithfulness? Not just to God, but to them. We can look at that several different ways. They walk away. Do you ever get tempted to walk away when they walk away? God never walks away. No matter how much you and I screw up, Jesus is still sitting there interceding for us 
in faith, waiting for the bride to be made perfect, spot, wrinkle, no spot, no wrinkle, no blemish. Never wavers. Never says, ah, boy, God almost gave it up yesterday. That old Mike Anderson, he went and he did this and he did that. I, you know, God, this ain't never going to come to pass. But I'll stick with it. Nope, he never wavers. That's why he's the man. <clears throat> it says, not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our righteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? Notice what it says. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? What does that scripture mean to you? When Isaiah looked up and saw the Lord, what did he say? Woe is me. me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Why did he make that statement? Because he saw God's righteousness. And he saw it through his what? His unrighteousness. That's what it means. In other words, every time, and this is the neat thing about God, is that every time he reveals our unrighteousness, doesn't it reveal more of his righteousness? You see him bigger, cleaner, purer than you did before. See what I mean? I mean, everybody always says, oh yes, God is pure, God is good, God is righteous. But does anybody really know what that means when we say that? Do you think you and I have the fullness of God's righteousness right now? But do you think you have a greater understanding of it now than you did, say, 10 or 15, 20 years ago? How did that happen? Huh? Huh? Because he was as he reveals our unrighteousness, and I'll get into this in a minute because it, it all sounds negative right now, but I promise it gets better because Paul is starting out negatively. He's showing us where we're at first, and then he's going to show us how to get delivered, <clears throat> and that's where the fatal mistake was made in what we're about to read. But every time God reveals our unrighteousness here on the earth, and how many times does he do that for us? Every time, every time we just about, we open our mouth, right? And every time that conviction comes in, what are you, you're recognizing God's righteousness. And you see, the problem with that, we're going to read that in a minute, is that people were actually beginning to say, Paul was preaching, be unrighteous, so that it'll, it, it'll make, it'll show God's righteousness. That's what some people were saying Paul was preaching. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing His wrath on us? I'm using a human argument. Certainly not. For if that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases His glory or recognition, why am I still condemned a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result? Who does that sound like? There you go. Thank you. There you go. Sin and sin boldly. Martin Luther. That's the Martin Luther Reformation. That's what he discovered because he made a fatal mistake here. And just when we get down here a little further, and that's where we'll stop today. 
he made a fatal mistake in how he interpreted something. And see, he interpreted this, sin, remember the quotes that I have in my Bible? Sin and sin boldly. When the devil comes to you and says, don't drink, I'll tell him, freely I'm going to drink and do some merriment and do a bunch of stuff just to show him he doesn't have any power over you. It's exactly what Martin Luther was preaching because he misinterpreted something down here a little bit later. And it turned out to be a fatal mistake. And you know what? That still resides probably in the inside of us, but it's still really uh, deep within the church out there in America today. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all, are all under the power of what? Sin. Sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are in open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, if you read that, all of you that have pasts that you think are so terrible, this should comfort you. Because notice what it says, there is no one good, no, not one. So don't think your past is worse than anybody else's. So many people get caught up. I mean, and I know this is big in our church, and I've heard it again for 30 years, even the people who are no longer here, oh, I raised my kids so terribly. You didn't raise them any terrible earlier than anybody else. Don't, yeah, you may have gotten involved with this, you may have gotten involved with that, but from God's standpoint, what is the difference between somebody who was abused physically or somebody who was raised in a self-righteous attitude and now can't even hardly hear God because they think they're okay? At least somebody who's, been, who's down in the gravel can come up. But if you already think you're up, where are you going to go with that? So quit thinking, you're, and there's no one good that we're all had open, our throats were open tombs, all, we had all of this. Besides, we just read that people are without excuse. Didn't we just read that back in a chapter ago? Because it's clearly, attributes are clearly visible. All right. This is the verse I've been trying to get to. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. That's the verse I've been waiting to get to. Go back up here, remember what it said, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. And so if we read this, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And this is where the mistake was made, is that Martin Luther thought that the works of the law was obeying the law. That's not the works of the law. The works of the law is the works of the law we become conscious of our sin. So you say, what are you saying? I don't get it. I'll just give you a one-liner. How many of us think, or used to think, we don't now, but used to think that when we went to church, the more bad you felt the more righteous you thought you were. Isn't that how it was preached to us? Is we would go to church, and the guiltier we felt, the more justified, more sorry, the more justified we felt we were before God. God. 
And that's where Martin Luther made his mistake because he thought the works of the law were the actual obeying of the law. That's not the works. Why does the law come? It's, yeah, it, it's, the, the Scripture says that the, the law was given so that sin might be exceedingly sinful. Scripture says that where there is no law, there is no, how do you say that? In, 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 yeah, it's not imp, sin is not imputed, but, but Paul writes and he says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though there was no law. But you notice they lived a whole lot longer. So the law comes, any law comes to reveal to us how sinful and how righteous God is. How sinful we are. Yeah, and and, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. How sinful we are, but reveals the righteousness of God. So then those who desire to want to obey God, what, what are we left with? You've given us the spiritual law, God. It's revealed how sinful we are. Now how do we get free? The law was given so that we would recognize how sinful we were and push in to God and say, this is what Paul says later. So I have, that's what I say. I have to bring other things up that he said. He said, it pushes me into God so that I can begin to obey the law instead of operate in the works of the law. Told you it was going to be hard. <clears throat> That's why we preach about sin in the church. Why do we preach about sin? So that sin will be exceedingly sinful, and that's supposed to push you to say, I need you, God. That's why it says the law is our tutor to bring us to Christ. And Paul found that out. He said, he said, when the law came that said don't covet, there it is. All I have to do is not covet. But he said, I found something else inside of me that was going to war against me. And the fact that he makes this statement too, and it's kind of a tongue-talking, tongue-twisting statement. He says, he says I probably should read it because it's so tongue-twisty. I better go to it. See, how many times do you hear people say they don't want to earn their salvation? What do you think they're meaning? But what, what, so what do they think the works are? Obeying. Obeying it. Where did they get that? They got that from Martin Luther. Because he misinterpreted what the works were. He thought the works were obeying it. That's not the works. The works are, it reveals our sin. That's the works of the law. Galatians puts it, calls it the works of the flesh. Yeah, in other words, what it in other words, what it does, what it reveals is our sin. That's the works of the law. But that's not obeying the law. In other words, if I'm not if I look at the law and it says don't commit adultery, and I'm not committing adultery, that's not the works of the law. The works of the law is it's revealing how bad adultery is. But anytime you hear anybody talk about works or earning their way to heaven, they, they're actually thinking about obeying. The minute you start talking about tithing, yeah, when you talk about doing works, you talk about tithing, you talk about church attendance, you talk about raising your kids right, anything. The first thing that'll come out of their mouth, well, I don't want, how many of you have heard this? I don't like this term. I don't want to be under legalism. What they're really saying is, I don't want to obey that. Because now I'm earning my way to heaven. That was never God's intent. It was never Paul's intent to write that. The law was given to reveal our sin to us. That's the works of it. When you, uh, let me read this first, okay? And then, we'll, then we'll explain it, okay? This is Paul writing. This is up in verse chapter 7. Verse 14. 
Well, let me go 13. This is what I mean. He should have put this right here, back where, we, where I just left off. But it's clear up here. It says, did that which is good then, he's talking about the law, become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death. So that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. That's the work of the law right there. We know that the law is spiritual, right? But I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Does that ever happen to anybody? How many times during the week, we know we're supposed to do something, we want to do it, but we do what we hate. And then later we're, oh God, I'm so sorry, oh I did this, I did that, oh I got to hate it, I said that, oh I feel so terrible in it. I see, that's what, that's what Paul is writing here. He says, and if, if I, and, and he says, that which I, and what I hate, I do. And if what, and if I do what I do not, <laughs> and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Now, what is he saying there? Huh? What? I think that he's saying like, um, now I've got to find it again. <clears throat> that if um, you do what you do not want to do, then you agree that the law is good. So that the law is bringing you to like repentance. Cl that's close. She's close. It's you're, you're agreeing because you're, you're, doing what you're, you're doing what you don't want to do, you're agreeing that the law is good. See, if you didn't agree that the law was good, you'd just go ahead and do it and you wouldn't care. You know what I mean? It wouldn't bother you. That, we've got half the battle. If you can agree that God's law is good, we've got half the battle. But there's another half, and that's where Martin Luther left off, and that's where most churches leave off, is they leave it right there. And that's all Paul is saying in all that tongue-twisting talk is if I'm doing what I don't want to do, then I'm obviously agreeing that what God has said is good. Okay. Let, no, no, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. I'll give an example. I'll bring it down to our lives, Okay. How many of you did something bad this week to, against God? Come on, I'm not gonna. Call, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tell you to call on you or anything because we all have. All right. Why do you think it was bad? Because you agree. You agree with whatever it is you think. You agree that whatever it was you did that was bad. You agree that laws that God's law was good. Otherwise, you wouldn't have thought it was bad. For instance, thou shalt not kill. If I went out and killed somebody and I knew it was wrong, I'm agreeing that thou shalt not kill is a good law. If I don't agree that it's a good law, I wouldn't care. I'd kill and it wouldn't even phase me. You see what I mean? Does that understand? Can you understand? Can you get quicker? I mean, can you? Yeah. <laughs> Before I knew God and served him, I did all the things, time, things all the time that were against his law, and they really didn't bother me. Seriously. Yeah. It, it really amazes me even still, people who have been church their whole life and are so upset by their past, and I look at them and I think, you didn't do anything like I did. You didn't even come close to doing the things I did. And those things barely bothered me at the time. I didn't like the consequences of what they produced, right. but the actual actions, I didn't sit around feeling guilty or thinking I shouldn't have done that because I didn't know the law. The, and I love this. The law, I always have wondered what that means. The law makes sin exceedingly sinful. It makes your eyes open. open. Okay, so... I committed adultery back then. I didn't care because my flesh liked it. Now my eyes are open to what adultery does. Not, and God isn't just saying, 
I'm pointing out your sin so I can punish you Absolutely. so you can look bad. Absolutely. He's saying, I want you to see how sinful, exceedingly sinful this sin is, is because it destroys you. Now I look at adultery and I see exactly how it destroys people's lives over and over and over again because the law has made that sin exceedingly sinful in my eyes. <laughs> see, she, uh, uh, she's a real breakdown teacher. I like that. Um. <laughs> So see that's what I'm see that's what that's that's the works of the law the work in other words you feeling bad about yourself let me put it this way you feeling bad about yourself you feeling bad about your past or what you did even last week well your past would be last week wouldn't it be yesterday you feeling bad about that is not going to produce the righteousness of God that in itself is not going to produce the righteousness of God and yet that's almost ex everything that's taught in church today. That's what's preached today. That's what's preached today. Is you go to church and you feel bad about yourself of everything you should know, and they'll read the law to you. They'll read, I mean, how, 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 and I've been to a lot of churches, but usually, and it's even denominational ones, and they'll read a scripture, and then they'll read all of these stories about all of these great saints that did all of this stuff. And as you sit there and listen to it, you just start to feel worse and worse and worse because you don't get up at 4 o'clock in the morning by candlelight and pray for three hours in the morning. How many of you do that? <laughs> now, but see, you're preached at like, you should be doing that. You should be out there witnessing and knocking on doors. And you, should be do you shouldn't be doing this and you should be doing that. And you just sink further and further into your chair and you walk out feeling bad thinking that now God is pleased with you because you feel so bad, now I'm justified. God counts that unto me for righteousness. As long I'm, as I'm sorry enough for what I did, if you were church, in, you'd know what I'm talking about. If I'm sorry enough for what I did, then God's yeah, or didn't do, God's pleased with me. And that's where they left it. And we've had that for 500 years. And that's ingrained in a lot. It still crops up now and then. You start preaching about raising children. You start preaching about tithing or something like that. And immediately somebody's going to go, oh, I don't want to be under that legalism. And question, how many of you agree? Here's the law. This is the law. How many of you agree? And now, now, now there is no middle ground. You can't say, well, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. It's either, either or. How many of you think tithing is good? Or do you think it's evil? All right, so that's a law, right? How many of you think that, uh, oh, what else can we say? Okay, coming to church. How many of you think that, is that good or is that evil? That's good. How about what else? Praying. How about, re how about, uh, how about uh, raising your children in the way that they should go? Is that good or is that evil? You, you know, see, what we do is we say, well, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes tithing's good, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes this is good, sometimes it's not. But no, it's either or. So when God's law comes and it shows us we're exceedingly sinful, notice what it says. It says the law brings wrath. We haven't read it yet, but it's in there. Maybe I need to finish this. <laughs> well, I know this is turning long, folks. I'm sorry. <clears throat> but we know the law is... Okay, I've already read all that. I'm in... Uh, I'm going to read 16 again. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good. See, how many of us have the desire to do what is good? We have that desire, don't we? But I cannot carry it out. How many times have you said that to yourself? I know I'm supposed to be doing it. I know this is the way it's supposed to be, but I cannot carry it out. I mean, does it almost get discouraging? Uh, for I do, for I do not do the good that I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. 
Anybody have a problem in a certain area where they keep on doing the same thing over and over? Okay, this is what Paul is writing. Paul isn't doing this. He's describing to you the works of the law. See, there's a lot of us under law that don't realize we are. Just because we know the right phraseology, we think we're under, we, we love to say we're under grace and faith, but you'll find out that a lot of times we're under law. Now, if I do what I Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then, in other words, if I'm by myself, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law, but my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. That's if I'm by myself. That's why we have to get the life of Christ in us, so it's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. So what is Paul saying about this? Let me give you an example. Those of you that are mothers and fathers, you, you stir your children's law of sin and death all the time. How many times you tell them not to touch anything, what happens? If you tell them to, to not touch something or you can't have that, what happens? You're stirring a law that's inside of them. It wasn't that big a deal. And you notice how exceedingly sinful it gets when you tell them no? Have you ever noticed that? You tell your child they want something, and they don't act like they want it that bad, but you tell them no, and all of a sudden they're on the floor kicking and screaming. The law just made sin exceedingly sinful. So why was the law given? Again, it was given so that the sin would become exceedingly, we would recognize it as such and say, I can't deliver myself from this. I can't get free of this. God, I cannot keep, that's why it's our tutor to bring us to Christ. I cannot get free of this. I have to turn to you. And I press in, and I press in, and I press in. And somehow, by pressing in, by relating to him, by hearing his voice, all of a sudden I find I'm starting to obey God's laws. See, it says the law brings wrath. You familiar with that scripture? It says the law brings, what does that mean that the law brings wrath? What did we learn wrath was? Desire with anger. Now, there's several ways we can look at that, and I'm going to pick this way this morning, is that we have other desires, don't we? See, we know what's right. We know what God's law is, but we have other desires. And so when we pick other desires, it makes us angry because we know we're supposed to have this desire. Do you think the Pharisees were angry people? Why? When, wait, wait a minute. When was their anger manifested? When the man who lived the law, and he lived it with joy, with desire, peace, grace... Because you see, the Pharisees had, they had the law. They had a desire to keep it, but they had other desires. Did they have desires for money? Did they have desires for prestige? Did they have desires for the best seats in the synagogue? So when somebody comes along and lives it according to grace... 
desire and anger flare up? You get it? <laughs> you just got it, huh? Desire and anger flare up. Huh? You've seen it. Yeah. When I used to teach about tithing, boy, people would get upset. And I'm thinking, because they had a desire, they knew, they agreed that the law was good, but the law brings wrath. That's why you don't want to be under it very long. Because what it does is you start seeing other people that are living the law through grace and faith, and it, it, it anger rises up inside of people. When people get angry, and I, you know what I mean by angry? You know, they got that. You know you've touched there under the law in that area. And, they're, and, they're, and, and they'll sit there and they'll argue with you, and the very, the very anger will tell you, I don't want to be under the law. When I used to teach on tithing, well, I don't want to be under, I don't want to be under legal, I don't want to be under the law. But their anger that's rising up shows me that you already are. You're agreeing with the law that it's good, but you don't want to do it. You've got other desires in there, and that rises up anger inside of you. Remember when Paul was standing at watching somebody get stoned? I think his name was Stephen. Do you think he was happy-go-lucky at that moment? Do you see anger in a man named Paul as he's running to and fro to throw Christians in jail? Why is he doing that? Why is, why is he so adamant about going and throwing everybody in jail? And why are they laying clothes at his feet and he's consenting to the stoning of Stephen? Because he's seeing a man there that's obeying the law that he's supposed to be in obeying and he ain't doing it. And it, and it causes anger in people. Murderous rage. It's why they hated Jesus. They knew they were supposed to. They agreed that the law was good, but they weren't going to obey it. They had other desires in there. And when you have other desires, it raises up anger. I told Kathy, I said, whatever your strongest desire is, that's what you'll live by grace and faith. Everything else will be law. No matter what it is. If deer hunting is my number one thing in my life, that will be grace and faith. Because anything else I do... I'll always wished I was out deer hunting. See how many people come to church this morning wishing they were somewhere else? I don't have time to go in this morning because I've really belabored all of this. And, and that, but, you know, it says the law... You know what? It says... To, he who, we'll read this hopefully next week. He who works... It's an obligation. In other words, when you're working, when you're actually doing works, you feel obligated. How many times have we heard that? Through 30 years, you know. How many of you have ever felt that? If, you're, if you feel obligation, then you're under works. You're agreeing with whatever you're being obligated to do is good, but you're not going to faith and grace to get it. Hmm? It becomes labor. Nobody enjoy, listen, nobody enjoys obligation. I don't care what it is. If you're obligated to go to a wedding, you'll drive away complaining. You know, well, I'm sure it lasted a long time. But very few people that feel obligated to do something come out of there and say, wow, man, that was really great. Oh, I'm sure glad I went, this and that and everything else. There's usually, well, you know, it went long, it was hot, it was, you know. And that's where Martin Luther made his fatal mistake was he interpreted the works of the law as obeying the law. And so we've got everybody, we've got an entire church for 500 years that if you, the minute you start trying to get them to obey anything, what are they going to tell you? I don't want to do works. I don't want to do works. Because they think the works of the law is obeying the law. 
No, the works of the law just make sin exceedingly sinful. And it's supposed to push you towards Jesus. You're supposed to agree with the law that it's good and then say, I can't keep this. I need you. I need you to cause me to lose my life, die, and resurrect so I have the same desires that you have, Jesus. So that it's no longer I that live, but you who live in me. Think Jesus ever skimped on his tithe? I know it's been kind of a little bit of a, been a long service, been a little hard maybe to understand. It's so clear when I'm half asleep. It's like I'm seeing heaven almost in a light dream or something, and it's so clear. But until we understand this, until the church understands this, we're going to have a rough time. We're going to have a rough time. You got something you want to say? You look like you're about ready to come off the edge of your seat. Just thinking how you started out that the wrath of God is desire with anger. That can be God or the devil. Yep. So every situation you come to, every time you see an attitude in you or a character flaw or sin in you, both kinds of wrath are going to be there. It's which one are you going to yield to? Mm -hmm. You're going to have the wrath of Father God that's going to say, I see this, what this sin is doing to you, and I'm coming with a desire to set you free of it, and it makes me angry that this is able to do it to you, and you can yield to that. Or, if the enemy sees you doing that, then he's going to put the pressure on even more. Because just like you said, the minute you, you, you just said, like you tell your kids not to do something, not to touch something, immediately they want to do it. Why did that increase? Because the minute you saw it as sin and don't want to do it anymore, then the wrath of the enemy, God, comes and puts more pressure on because he's scared to death that you're going to yield to God and get free of it, and he's not going to have any control over you in that area. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in every situation, you're going to have the wrath of Father God coming, and you're going to have the wrath of the devil coming. That's why the circumstances look like they get worse, is because the minute you yield to God and start to get free from something, the enemy's going to try harder to keep that control on you. So it is going to get, it always gets worse before it gets better. Right. When you recognize something in you, a sin in you, and you start yielding to God's way of getting free of it, the circumstances always get worse until, you, until it comes to that place where he realizes, okay, they've yielded to God, they're not giving in to this anymore, and then he usually will go away and leave you alone. What it seems like to me is he'll go away and leave you alone for a while, and then a month later you'll be a, get a little temptation in that. And if you pass that, then it'll be six months, you'll get a little temptation. If you pass that, then it'll be a year, then five years, and then pretty soon that thing doesn't seem to have a hold on you anymore. Um, let me read this here in Timothy before we stop. First <clears throat> uh, Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 8 says, We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and the sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers or murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which he entrusted me. So anything that, that's against sound principles or sound doctrine, that's who the law is for, right? <clears throat> See, the problem is we read this and we think we're talking about somebody that lives this fully. How many of us have these things in our lives, maybe just occasionally? Do you think you ever have something in your life, maybe in the last month, that's been contrary to sound doctrine? <laughs> Hope so, yeah. 
Well, I don't hope so, but I mean, you probably should because you're not perfect yet. So then why does Paul say that the law is used for that? See, that's why we preach on sin is so that sin would become exceedingly sinful. The problem is, is how to get free of it was left off. It was never taught to people how to get free of it. By pressing into God and dying to yourself, when we know this principle, dying to yourself, hearing His voice, and being buried and resurrected. Paul says, count yourself, reckon yourselves as dead. Because dead people don't sin. So that's why I could never understood why people, when they, when they would say, well, I don't want to get saved by the works of the law. I couldn't understand why Jesus came and said, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. I couldn't understand why Paul could write, the law is good if one uses it lawfully. See, I couldn't understand those things because it made it sound like we weren't supposed to try to obey it, that we couldn't obey it. And if we tried, then we wouldn't get righteous. But notice what it said in Romans, only those that obey are righteous before God. And He gave us the ability to obey. That ability is there for every one of us. And recognize that when anger rises up in you, you might want to check your law o meter. <laughs> See what I mean? <clears throat> Jesus got righteously and indignant, didn't he? But he never got angry with that with that ant thing. You know what I mean? Any other question? I don't know if it's a question, but I need to talk it out. <laughs> okay. So what you're saying is that the law was put in place to show us our sinfulness, but the church got stuck there and made the law and sin an idol. Mm -hmm. So it's to make us turn and know like how bad it, it is, you know, kind of like God's heart, not the law, but... Uh, to transform our hearts into his heart, you know, so like we wouldn't lust or we wouldn't um, have love of money or whatever. And it's a turning and pressing further into God with a desire, a hunger, and a thirst to get rid of that. Like how you were saying, going to the house of hope and healing and like we go for uh, sickness, but we don't go for these things. So it's like a Instead of just saying, okay, here's my sin, and now I'm aware of my sin, it's a, a pressing further in into God to say, God, I can't have this anymore. You need to take this away from me and to keep going and to keep pressing and right. keep going and keep pressing until in that area, grace and faith has taken over, right? Right. And I like what you said about grace and faith because... Uh, um, and, in that, and I like what you said about in that area. Grace and faith in that area. Because um, you, uh, we have so many different areas, you know what I mean, to be set free in. We've got so many different areas. And, and so we can actually look when Paul was talking about the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. Each one of us has different areas where that happens, doesn't it? In other words, there's certain areas where we don't have any problems, is there? But there's other areas where we still are doing things we don't want to do, right? But because we don't want to do them, we're agreeing that whatever it is we're not doing, we're agreeing that that law is good. But who's going to deliver us from that? So like you said, you just keep on pressing and you keep on pressing. And I think we're not desperate enough. I think we need more desperation in the area of spiritual sickness than in physical. Like I said, we're so desperate when it's terminal. If we get a terminal disease, then we're desperate. But if we have a spiritual sickness, we're not that. We, 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 I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying we add it to all the other things that are important, and it doesn't become a life and death thing to us. Do you know what I mean? I mean, if we really want victory over death, if we really want a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, I think we, like you said, we have to get to the point where we're so desperate and pressing in that we want to be free of these things like we do with a physical illness. 
And until we do that, they're important to us. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying until we get to that point, it's going to be very difficult to have, for God to have a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Okay, so I asked this when they were switching the CDs, and I just wanted you to say this oh, again. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's did okay. I, did I not answer it? No, you did. Okay. But, like, I just wanted to, I just had a thought, too. Okay, where you're saying that, um, all right, the works of the law that Martin Luther said, uh, taught that the works of the law was the obeying of the law. Right. But what you're saying, the works, it's the law that does the working. We're not doing the working. It's the law right. that does the work. To re right. And I was thinking, isn't that the very nature of Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist? It's without Christ. It's like trying to do these things. Mm -hmm. And it's like that spirit of Antichrist is us doing the work. Right. But see, if the law does the work, and then the gr by the grace and the power of Jesus... Then we can do these things. Then we can change. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so what you're saying is, okay, so Martin Luther says the works of the law was the obeying of the law. That's what Martin Luther taught. And that's, but what you're saying is the works are the revealing of our sin. It's the law working to reveal our sin that pushes us into God so that he can change us. Mm -hmm. Right? That's yeah. what you're saying. Absolutely. <laughs> The work that the law does is not getting us free from our sin. The work no. that the law does is show us how exceedingly sinful the right. sin is. And just like you, yeah, yeah. And then his grace comes in. That's what sets us free from right. the sin. And like what you were just saying about it not being that important to us yet, we haven't seen the exceedingly sinfulness of it yet. And I know how many times, as Kathy said, you will live with something until you get to that place where you abhor it. And I, don't, I know I have, and some of you have too. You'll live with something for a few years, and then all of a sudden it does something to you, and you open your eyes and you abhor that thing, and you think, I cannot have this in my life another day. Like I remember that time that anger was taken over me that I was like shaking and twitching, and I realized if I don't do something right now, this is going to take me so far, I'm not going right. to be able to come back from it. And I abhorred it. I wanted to get up at, it was like 10, 11 o'clock on a Wednesday night, and I wanted to drive to World Revival Church and find somebody to set me free. And God said, why do you need to go there? You've got prayer warriors here. And he did set me free from that. I got angry again after that, but that thing didn't have control over me anymore. And I abhorred it from that point that every time it came from then on, I kept handing it back to God until that terrible, bitter anger thing that was there wasn't there anymore. Yeah. But it took me seeing how exceedingly sinful it was mm -hmm. before I wanted to get rid of it. So again, I'm going to say again, because just like you're saying, the law is not there to set you free from the sin. No. The law is there to show you how sinful sin is. is. So you'll press into God so he can set you free of it. Then you, oper then you walk into grace and faith. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. So the, the thing that, bo that always bothered me was that people, whenever I talked with them, especially denominational people, is the works, they always thought it was trying to obey the law. So the minute you try to t tell them, you know, well, we need to pray or we need to read our Bibles or something, like, well, I don't want to be under, you're putting me under the law. You're trying to get me saved by works. Yeah, all of us that went to church did. That's not what the works of the law is. Because Paul said we had to be obedient to the law in order to be righteous. He's, he's now, I know, he, the way he put it together, it really, it's hard. It's like, I don't know if God did that on purpose to fool people. Because it's kind of difficult, to, you have to read it over and over and over again to get God's mind on it of what he's really saying. And look at how terribly we've limited Jesus in the church. How, look at what we've limited him down to as to what he provided on the cross. You know, I mean, we've, got, we've expanded a little bit with the physical healing and the prosperity and things like that. But just look at the, you know, when we recognize how exceedingly sinful everything is, and that Jesus set us free from all of that, look at how big, I mean, it, 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 we've just, we've made him this big, is what we put him in a little box. And he has no, he has no real power, no real, um, you, you know, you accept him as your savior, and that's, what does that mean? When, when you're told that in, in most churches, you accept him as your savior, what does that mean? This means you wait and die to go, look at everything that he provided isn't even taught. Martin Luther left all that out. 
He was the one that said, you go to heaven. <clears throat> See, I mean, that's why, you know, the, some of you may not understand this, that you loathe yourself, and so you think you're righteous. Why do you think they crawled up steps on shards of glass? What do you think they were trying to do? Huh? They were trying to punish themselves and show God how terrible they were. But they would crawl up on shards of glass to show that they were to try to to try to to show the righteousness by how terrible we are, and that still exists in the church today. Still exists in the church today. And it's not what God wanted at all. I just started reading yesterday Culture of Honor from uh, Danny Silk. A, a set of students that had went through the first year of their school ministry in between the first and second year started having sex. They did it for a month or so, whatever, then realized it was wrong, repented, quit doing it, then found out she was pregnant. Here they are getting ready to go in their second school year school ministry. The youth pastor comes in to him. He's the head pastor and says, what are we going to do about this? So they bring them into their office. They're in with their heads down. They are like, we're going to get kicked out of school. We're going to get, you know, because we deserve punishment for what we did and everything. And he starts ask, asking them, what's the problem that we're dealing with here? Well, didn't he, did they tell you we had sex? Well, yeah, I know. But what's the problem that we need to solve? Well, she's pregnant. He said, I know, but if we're going to solve a problem today, what's the problem that we need to solve? And through asking a bunch of questions, it came out, he did it because she would get mad at him if he didn't stay at her house late enough, and then it would turn into that. She would do that because she was afraid people were going to control her, and she didn't want to be controlled, and she wanted, so she controlled everything around her. And by the time the whole thing was over, they were both sobbing, seeing the sin in them that had controlled them, that had caused them to do that thing that they did not want to do. And they ended up going to their family and repenting, asking forgiveness. They ended up going to the second-year students who ended up repenting with them. They were all crying, praying over them. Then the second-year students all went with them to the first-year students, and it was another. I mean, you have to read the story the way he wrote it because I was crying through the whole thing. They ended up having the baby, and they prayed over them that the shame would not touch the baby, that the enemy had no hands on the baby. She had the baby. The baby was born, had a blood disease, was dying in the hospital, and they kept calling and saying that the last time they called, said the doctor said she's not going to make it through the night. And he hung up the phone and he said, no, God, you prayed over that. You know, he had that guy pray that this shame wouldn't touch her and that the devil couldn't have her and death and destruction had no place. The next morning, she, they said she was a baby Lazarus and she came out of it. Okay, my whole, and then that girl, the third year student came up and said, gave a speech and she said, if this had been handled any other way, it probably would have destroyed us. But because it was handled, I mean, I mean, to me, this is the exact story of what you're talking about. Everybody, every time we sin, we walk in with our heads down thinking God is going to punish us, that he wants to beat on us, that it will make him feel better, it will make us feel better, everybody feel better if we get beat up because of the sin we just committed. And all he wants to do is set us free. Right. <clears throat> and through that story, he set both of them free of something that was destroying them and changed their lives forever because it was handled by the grace of God instead of by the law punishing them. You know, just like the woman that they threw at Jesus' feet. They wanted him to punish her, and instead he set her free and gave her grace. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> about how we like okay so we feel bad like the law it reveals our sin we feel bad and then we stop short we think well that's it that's what needs to happen instead of the law is the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ see it leads us to Jesus and he's the one that right. sets us free yeah. not our sobbing and not our being so sorry it leads us it brings us to Jesus who's the only one that can set us free right. but the godly sorrow brings you to Christ the worldly sorrow just keeps you whining and crying and crying and crawling on shards of glass. But and even, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do any good. But don't you think too? The church has we've even godly sorrow. We've stopped there instead of going to Jesus, right. thinking that that's in itself the answer. Yeah. 
And it's to lead you to the one that can set you free. Yeah. And see, that's one of the reasons why preachers preach on sin. Is to show that it's exceedingly... How do we preach on sin? We preach on sin by showing God's law. By showing what's right. Right? right? And so, but the problem is, we leave it there. We show you your sin. Right. You're, you're sitting there terrible for how you feel. Stop short. And then it's, you know, a benediction and it's all out the door. Yeah, and you go right back out the door and do what you don't want to do, you know. And you're never, you're never given the, the, uh, the uh, answer as to how to get free of all of this stuff. And that's what we're here for now, and that's what I want to see happen in the church, not just this one, but the church worldwide to get free of all of these things that a lot of things we don't even think are that bad. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, that's why I like God's law, because it shows us... Exceed, in other words, like you said, you didn't think it was exceedingly sinful until God showed it to you. Right. And that's why we preach the things and use the illustrations that we use is so that it'll hit you and it'll become exceedingly sinful. Hopefully, you won't have wrath, desire, and anger. <laughs> but usually, it, it, does happen. it happens that way. People get angry. When you, when you go to another church and you start lifting your hands and start waving to God and singing like that, what do people do? Do they get angry? Yep. Why? Because they know, they, because they know what's right. It brings, the law brings wrath. They're under law, so it brings wrath. Mm. So they're angry at you. All you're doing is this. You're just singing along and everything, and what happens? You're not, you're not sitting in their seat. You're not tearing their clothes. You're not lifting their wallet. You're not doing, why do they get angry at you? Because they're under the law. See, church, most church people are under the law, and that's where they stay. They never push into Christ. Okay. See? The minute you lift your hands, all of a sudden, desire and anger comes in that person. <laughs> Happens every time. But see, to somebody who looks and who agrees with the law is good, they're going to look at that person and they're going to say, what do they have that I don't have? Why do they act like they got a better, like they actually know God and I don't? Here's the law bringing me to Christ. I want to learn what they have. So I start asking, seeking, and knocking, and what happens? Pretty soon, I'm doing this. Because that lets God in. I know it had to take a long time to get there, but I had to read the first parts of it to show you areas of our life where we still have ins you know, insolence, lust, all of those different things where we're still under the law. Okay? Anybody else? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. <laughs> It's a long one, sorry. It was long, and, I, and God, I just thank you that you give those people on the internet grace to listen. I thank you for our young people that attend here. I thank you, God, that, my God, even though the word is still going forth, it's still going into their spirits. They still recognize that God is here because they're spiritual beings. And I just thank you, Lord, that you give understanding to those on the internet and give more understanding to us. I know the people in here. I know what they're going to do. They're going to go home and they're going to meditate and they're going to. And a lot of people are going to come and have questions and teach stuff and, and all of that. And I'm th so thankful for that. So keep on building, keep on regurgitating, chewing the cud, so to speak, and getting every bit of nourishment out of this that we can. And Father, make us desperate to be healed in our spirit, in our soul. Make us as desperate as we are to be physically healed. And Lord, I thank you, God. I just thank you for who you are and what you've given to us. And we're still just scratching the surface. Reveal to us who you are. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.